Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Fred and Lou Hartwig family, Peter and Barbara Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize, and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics this week. It ain't over till it's over at KCI. The battle over Kansas taxes far from over and is the era of civic leadership over. Plus roast and toast. But we begin with our newsmaker segment and talk about some educational opportunities in Kansas City. The KC Scholars Program is designed to help young people and adults throughout the metro area to complete their educational goals with financial and other support. Here to discuss KC Scholars is Program Manager Valerie Salazar. Valerie, thanks for coming in. Welcome to Ruckus. Tell us about KC Scholars. What is it? How did it begin? Yeah, so KC Scholars were two years old. Um, in 2016, um, we were publicly announced here in, in Kansas City. We are a living legacy of Mr. Ewan Marion Kaufman and his commitment to post-secondary education here in Kansas City. Um, he did we, a lot of things, didn't he? He did, absolutely. And one of his heart, um, what he was passionate about was education. I remember the news coverage uh, some years ago when he was with a high school class. I think you told me earlier it was Westport High School. Correct. And he said to them, if you work hard and graduate, I'll pay for your college education. They did and he did and programs such as the one you have uh, were the result. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we received a significant contribution from the Kauffman Foundation and our own 501c3 um, public charity here in Kansas City, and we are working towards um, and supporting students to complete their college education. You know what I think is fascinating is not only are you helping high school students, you also help adults. We do, and that's a very unique um, piece of our program, actually unique for the nation, is to support adults that started college at one time in their life, and then life happened, um, and now want to go back to complete either that credit-bearing credential associate's degree or bachelor's degree. So we support uh, them as well. And your deadline, I think, is coming up fairly soon. March it is, 1st. yes, so March 1st, so we're in crunch time. Um, there's still plenty of time to start the application and apply, but the deadline for our 2019 application is March 1st, and we will award almost 1,200 awards in May. And what are the amounts? Do they vary? They do. Um, we have a program for ninth graders, um, for 11th graders, as well as adults. Um, and for our 11th grade, our traditional scholarship, um, it's a value um, of up to $50,000, a $10,000 renewable for up to five and, years. And when somebody receives one of these scholarships, they have to attend a university or college in the metro area. Correct. A big philosophy of Casey Scholars is making sure that we boost this region um, and the economy here in Kansas City. So kind of that whole study local, live local, eat local. Uh, we want our students to study local and come back into the workforce. So we have a network of 17 colleges and universities. Okay, walk us through what people need to do, either if they're in high school or they're adults who want some help going to college, finishing college. What steps do they have to take now? Yeah, absolutely. So start um, at our website, kcscholars.org. Um, they can learn about the eligibility requirements and see if they qualify and are eligible. Um, and then they can start the application there. Um, if they have any questions, they can reach out to us um, at KC Scholars. We'd be more than happy to assist them. Um, but most importantly, it would be making sure that they start now. Um, as our deadline's quickly approaching, there's quite a few tasks that they need to complete in order to submit their application. Who decides if somebody gets a scholarship or not? Yeah, great question. Um, it's a process, so our, uh, we have a, a, it's scored, our applications are scored, um, and um, so there's a selection process among that. We look at the whole application, so it's important for... Not just grades? Not just grades. No, we have a minimum of 2.5 um, GPA um, for our 9th and 11th graders going into this, so we look at the whole application. There's essays, recommendations, there's an applicant form in which they're talking to us about what they're involved in the community um, and other items and that, so there's a whole application that's scored. But if some somebody gets online today mm -hmm. and, and starts to do the work, it is possible that person might still win a scholarship? Absolutely. Yep, there's plenty of time. Um, and plenty of money, it sounds like. And Yeah, and plenty. <laughs> and yeah, and we know that lots of folks like to wait until the last minute to apply. So yep, there's still plenty of time to apply. So once the scholarship is awarded and somebody goes to college or back to college, 
Do you monitor what they do? Yeah, absolutely. We continue to support them. We work with the colleges and universities um, as well as some student support service providers that work with us um, to make sure that those students and adults not only get to college, but that they complete their degree. Other than having a better educated community, what would you say are the results of KC scholars. Yeah, what we, what our hope and, and plan is, is that by 2027, we'll have almost 10,000 KC scholars back in our workforce pipeline here in Kansas City. It's part of the workforce development project. Yeah, absolutely. We we consider ourselves an inclusive work, workforce pipeline for Kansas City. Um, that we make sure that our students are hopefully going to be coming back and, and ready for those employers that are here in Kansas City. Well, I hope we encourage lots of people to uh, go to your website to uh, apply, and we'll hope for the best for them. Absolutely. Thank you thank very you. much for coming in. Pleasure yeah. to meet you. Yeah, Thanks same. for the information. Yeah, thank you. That is KC Scholars Program Manager Valerie Salazar. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus! Arthur Benson's a longtime and prominent Kansas City attorney. Gwen Grant is the president and CEO of the Urban League in Kansas City. Annie Presley is an author, publisher, and GOP fundraiser. Crosby Kemper III is the executive director of the Kansas City Library System and host of KCPT's Meet the Past and Centropolis. We are taping this program on Valentine's Day, so I really think that all of us should put our hearts into it. Oh. Okay. As long as that's not the kiss of death. Met with, <laughs> met with no response, just as I expected. Right, right, right. Baseball legend Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over. Yogi was not, but could have been, describing the effort to reach agreement and start building the new KCI One Terminal Airport approved by voters in November 2017. Last week, the city's aviation department and developer Edgemore Infrastructure announced agreement to build the facility for $1.5 billion, a half billion more than the plan offered to voters. Now all the airlines and the city council must achieve a final accord. That could be complicated by the mayor's race with several council members who have been in the airport debate seeking to survive the April primary. So are concerns about the project over or should we trust Yogi and say, it ain't over till it's over, Gwen? I think we trust Yogi on this one. <laughs> I mean, certainly, you, we don't want to think we're there yet. You know, if you're on a trip with your kids, are we there yet? Are we there yet? We're not there yet. Um, you know, I think that there still are a lot of questions to be answered. And, you know, the price tag, we don't know what the final price tag is going to be on the project. We don't know exactly what it entails relative to design because the price tag keeps moving. It was 1.64, now it's 1.5, and Edgemore said they needed to do it at 1.64, now they can do it for $1.5 billion. I think originally it was $1 billion, wasn't it? Well, yeah, it went from, it, it's just been, nine, nine, six, nine, it was that, just yeah, quite yeah. under. <laughs> so it's just, it's like that, that card game, is it uh, three card Monty or something, it, it, it just keeps moving. The target keeps moving, it's hard to find it. And I think it's really important for uh, the, the citizens and for the electorate to be very vigilant about asking for asking questions and seeking transparency and when are we going to know exactly how much it's going to cost when are we going to know exactly what is the impact going to be on travelers because many of us you know travel we want to know are our ticket prices going to go up I know there's been some indication that the the individual ticket price may not escalate any more than three to five dollars uh, but we need to know exactly what that or eight or nine you go into the stars editorial that used the five dollar word that five dollars is the in increase in employment cost, which actually is an 80 percent increase over our current employment cost. Our current cost of putting put someone on a plane is among the lowest of the mid mid uh, size hubs, and will go to one of the highest in the mid size hubs. So the stars, you know, this, these are phone, <coughs> phony numbers. That uh, you compare us to the Sacramento and the Indianapolis airports. They did a billion dollar terminal. Each of them did a billion dollar terminal, and in the immediate aftermath of the opening of those uh, new terminals, their ticket prices went up 15 percent, and that is what we will see. All right. How about the mayor's race? Is that going to have an impact on how this uh, airport matter turns out? 
I kind of suspect not. Um, I, I, uh, it, it, it may, but the, there's too much up in the air about the airport. Too many. <laughs> Is that a pun? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> too, too many details yet Hope to it be fall out of the air. Yet to be negotiated. <laughs> um, I, I think there are other sort of more important issues. The airport is essentially going to be paid with a, um, a, a load on those who use it. Um, it's, uh, there's a general consensus that we need a new airport, not terribly, but we do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just going to be done. It, it's, I, I suspect in the next 35, 45 days that other issues are going to be more prominent, like affordable housing, the high rate of sales tax in Kansas, in Kansas City. I think they will overshadow the airport. So this apparent agreement with the airport, does that boost the campaign of Julie Justice, who's running for mayor? She was the head of the airport committee. Well, there's six council members running. Julie chairs the airport committee. There are two other uh, candidates on the committee and and Arthur I actually disagree with you I think this is going to be a major campaign component for all these folks I mean Jolie has a lot to win and a lot to lose being the chairman she, it exactly. is very very complicated she has stayed on top of it we really aren't in charge well, of it but don't lose sight of how yeah because to me it's the 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 airport committee those uh, the, everyone running have really demonstrated poor leadership skills and, and well, how they've skills. managed this whole thing and management skills from the very beginning as I stated the last time I was here the clandestine meetings that Jolie Justice participated in uh, uh, relative to trying to bring this about so if I'm looking to elect someone I'm wanting them to be very transparent and I want I'm wanting them to show really sound judgment in how they manage this process and, and I and think she, they've all done she, she and the mayor are both lawyers and they sat there at that and made a one billion dollar no bid contract deal which is illegal under FAA rules it's illegal and they were told it was illegal and they still went ahead and, and did it. So I think that ought to be, it should be, a huge issue it's uh, gonna be in the an campaign. Issue. But, we question, want, but we do want our airport to hurry up. Oh, and we get need done. to hurry up, <laughs> for sure. Well, are you confident, Crosby, no public dollars will be spent in all of this? Well, you process? know, there, there's this lie that went on about borrowing money from the airport. The airport commission actually said that while they had money borrowed from the airport. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust the city uh, on, on that issue. That's final word okay. for now. A conservative website, The Sentinel, which is now part of the Kansas Policy Institute, reports that the Sunflower State now has the eighth highest state and local average sales tax rate in the nation, 8.67%. That's higher than Missouri and Kansas. This sales tax update comes as the state legislature gears up for major debates over income tax policy. Some GOP leaders want income tax cuts, Democrat Governor Laura Kelly does not. The Kansas City Star's editorial board thinks the decision is clear. Voters chose Laura Kelly last year, so voters don't want tax cuts. But the editorial failed to say that Kansans also elected and re-elected Republican legislators who do want tax cuts. So how in the world do we figure out what the public really wants, Annie? I actually looked for some polls to find out what Kansans are thinking about right now, and they really are non-existent. But let's let's just look back. Are you saying Kansans aren't thinking? Or well, no, not there, thinking there's about... just no polling to look oh, at. It's been so too cold. To Laura, think. Laura Kelly ran on three issues: one, education <laughs> funding, uh, Medicare enhancement, and uh, Capers payments. And these three components already make up 77 percent of their $15.5 billion exactly. budget for 2.8 million Kansans. So they're spending 77% of their budget already on this. So in the meanwhile, these Republicans in the legislature are wrestling with what kind of budget to send the governor, and the tax uh, cut that they've suggested is the equivalent of about $191 million right. that affects some wage earners and some corporations. So the struggle that we see, I think, is going to boil down to accountability. And one of the trends right now in education funding is that there is more money going to administration than there is student instruction. And I would suggest that this is the accountability that Kansans are actually looking for. So heavy lift. Let me put that same question to uh, Arthur. How do we figure out what voters really want when they seem to send mixed messages? Well, it's a good thing that we usually cannot. Uh, we're not a, a direct or a pure democracy. I think the star was wrong. You just can't uh, uh, impose a mandate on somebody because she was elected governor or they were elected to the legislature. Uh, voters do seem to pre prefer having divided government. So uh, 
um, with, with uh, the uh, Republican legislature and the Democrat uh, as the governor, the, the politics will, will work it out. I, I expect that the Kansas voters, if you can uh, infer anything from what they did, that they, they want compromise, they want all of these issues solved, um, even if there's not enough money to do it, then you may have to spend less, but try to accomplish as many as possible. Well, Crosby, one of the reasons Republicans say they want modifications in the tax law is to align Kansas policy with the federal changes in income tax. Right. Well, I, 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 it, it, that by itself is is a good idea, but uh, the, the problem for that for everybody in, in, in Kansas is, is to answer your original question: is the voters want lower taxes and higher spending, <laughs> and you can't you can't do that. So Republicans are going to have to figure out if they want a tax cut, which is you know, cutting tax is not a bad idea. Uh, uh, is what they're going to cut in the, in the budget. And as Annie pointed out, it's almost all health care and education now. You know, we, we have built this, and that wasn't true 40 years ago. Right now, it's all health care and education, and the, you know, the, the, they'll have to fight the, 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 can, the Kansas view, which is health care is a right, well, and we never spend enough money on education. Well, uh, Kelly's budget presumed that they could amortize the CAPERS program, and Republicans in the legislature are opposing that. And so if that is the case, then some of the money she was expecting to spend on Medicaid or, expansion, right. some of these other and, things, and, won't be available. And, and during the Brownback years, we, 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 we pretty much savaged the transportation budget, the CAPERS, uh, you know, trying to bring CAPERS up to uh, uh, full, full uh, funding. And you just can't, you can't do everything. And that, that, that's a lesson that we're having a hard time learning in this country. You look at the national deficit, which is now it, with a Republican deficit of a trillion dollars. Um, we're having a what hard time. What is it, up time. to $22 trillion now? Is that the, the, the total debt, budget? The, debt, total, yeah. the total debt, and that doesn't count all the off-the-books debt. Uh, Gwen, we often hear about sales taxes on food purchases in Kansas. Kansas is one of the states that, that charges a sales tax for food. And a lot of people oppose that, and Governor Kelly said she would try to do away with it. And thus far, I don't think there's been any action by Governor Kelly on that. Well, I mean, just give her a minute. Would it be a worthwhile <laughs> project for her to undertake? Well, she just well, got she's been there. in a month. <laughs> well, she was. <laughs> but that's not something she's been proposing, I don't think. Well, I, as I said before, give her some time. But I think it's important, I, you know, when you can reduce the sales tax or eliminate a sales tax on um, food, that's certainly going to... Uh, be uh, good for low-income families because sales taxes can, you know, on food can take some food items off your. Is there any enthusiasm menu. left for a battle over school finance in Kansas? I don't have any left for it. I'm about tired. I don't know since I'm not a, a Kansan. I would think not. Uh, we ought to be concentrated on on how we make education in Kansas better and not on how we how uh, how much money we're spending. The, the, this, the Supreme Court created a false. Uh, assumption that spending more money would r bring better education, and that's simply false. Well, the governor thinks there's going to be an agreement with a group uh, from the schools and say, if you give us this increase for inflation, we'll drop the lawsuit. Uh, but by the same token, they could file another lawsuit subsequently. Right. Well, there's, the Supreme Court is not really given uh, an outline of what, how much yeah. is uh, is correct. It's just never enough. <clears throat> Excuse me. In a recent column, the star's Dave Helling says the once powerful Citizens Association founded in the Pentergast era is disappearing and has been since the dawn of the 21st century. Helling doesn't see a resurgence of the elite group whose members he describes as mostly men, white and wealthy. Instead, he's hoping for a new group comprised of younger voters who will focus on today's issues, not the vice and corruption of past decades, but on livability, investments, subsidies, education, and public safety. Well, as someone who has been rather critical of Kansas City's civic leadership, or lack thereof, would something of this sort be a welcome addition to the local political landscape, Crosby? Well, ab absolutely. You know, the, the last time the C Citizens Association was, uh, you know, Dave Helling wrote this, this column, and the last time the Citizens Association uh, was uh, a bright, shining object was when Dan Coffrin was running it, and then Dan decided to run for mayor, and it was a star editorial written by our former colleague Yale, a really vicious editorial that d knocked Dan out of uh, uh, the mayor's race and basically, you know, out of, off the Citizens Association, so we ought to look back to, you know, why some of these things happen. 
happen. But yeah, we, 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 need, we need more civic engagement. I, I want to say something nice for the first time in my life about the Civic Council. I've had some conversations with them lately, and Bill Gotro's the... Well, let, let's identify it. It's made up of the top, what, 100 CEOs in the Kansas City area. Yeah, roughly speaking. And, uh, and, and it kind of disappeared from civic life a while ago. They have Casey Rising, which is a good jobs-oriented, quality jobs-oriented. Uh, but, you know, they haven't been active in the political arena, et cetera. Um, and uh, Bill Gotro is the new chair. Mark Hill, who's the new executive director. I think there's a, you know, there's sort of a new sheriff in town. And, and, and I, I think they're interested in getting back into uh, a leadership role uh, and, and working on things like opportunity zones and, uh, and, and other things. But that Crosby, do, do endorsements now mean anything uh, with the rise of the Internet uh, and social media? Yes, they a, do. A good meme now. Now seems to trump uh, to, uh, I, I think that's an right. endorsement. But, but I think they're actually I think they're very powerful forces at, at work. Uh, freedom, I think, is still re reasonably powerful. The Women's Political Caucus, I think, is is important. Um, I, I think there are important groups in in town. Right. Uh, but we, but I don't think we have the group that is just oriented towards good public policy that once upon a time we had. And I think that's a huge. Well, problem. you know, in the past, civic council won't talk to the news media, or rarely will talk to the right. news media. Do you think and, that, and that might change? I think that might. I th my, my guess is, I don't, don't know this for sure, but that, uh, that Mark Hill might want to go in that direction. You know, he, 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 he did that for, uh, for a similar group in, uh, in Nashville, and, and so I, I hope so. He's like the executive director He's the executive or something. Director. Yeah. Were you a member of it? No. Were you a member of it, Arthur? No, no. Annie? Nope. <laughs> but how could what Helling proposed uh, gain traction? I, I, I just don't think there is that much uh, interest um, in... Uh, participating in or being guided by the endorsements of a good government organization. The chamber's, well, the know, chamber's think, endorsement means think, a lot. Well, well, I think know, endorsements for are... For money, it does. Well, they mean a lot for a number of reasons. Yeah, they mean endorsements mean a lot for money, but it's not always money. It's, a, it's about what are the relationships, the connections, the influence, the visibility that a particular endorsement can bring. Because with endorsements from organizations like the Citizens Association, from organizations like Freedom Incorporated, if they weren't so important, folks wouldn't be vying to get them. They do mean something if you're running for something. I think that what we would like to see is that more of them, what they tend to do when they endorse, they're also sending somewhat of a policy message. But what, what you would like to see perhaps is a group that would come together yeah. and focus the, solely the, on the, policy the, implications. The, the real problem is who controls those organizations these days. And if you look at the money, follow the money is always a good rule in politics. And almost all of the money in the mayor's race and the council races is coming from a handful of groups that are about economic development policy, lawyers, developers, construction companies, and, uh, and the like. 70% of the money comes from uh, from those folks, and that is a huge distortion of the process. Well, and they control the chamber's endorsement, the downtown council's endorsement. Um, so we, we need but something it, to counterbalance free, that. in a free political process, there's nothing terribly wrong with that. I mean, it's just, but so basically, you, the more you can bring into that, you know, so that there is an opposite, so that there's a, an we, opposing view, we need, is a healthy thing. We need the peasants it's with unhealthy, pork, which piss, it's with pitchforks when, to, be, to be involved. It, Unfortunately, Right. with our, our regressive uh, tax policy, they can't afford Yeah, but it's force. unhealthy if one group has far much more power and control and there's no balancing of that. Right. Annie, are we missing any groups? What about CFRG, Citizens for Responsible Government, brought about the airport debate? There are Amen. women in politics, KCADC plays, but, but it tends to be all the same people populated throughout these different organizations. So it's a shame Citizens Association has kind of fallen right. by the wayside. Everybody else seems to be still Those are all good going. points, but I don't think the data shows that they move votes in any significant mm, oh, way, oh, other than maybe free. You need, free to, you need sure. to look at the numbers. Do you go, I yeah. think you need to, you and, have to kind of look at the polling numbers we'll before to you end this, make And of course, point. there's always <laughs> ruckus to turn to. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Now we head for <laughs> the soapbox for Roast and Toast, where the ruckets have 30 seconds each to abhor, deplore, or ignore, and we start with Gwen. Well, it's Valentine's Day, so Aww. I want to give out a little love today. No roasting today on Valentine's Day. I want to give a toast to Dr. Mark Bedell and the Kansas City Public School Systems, and Dr. Bedell particularly for his leadership uh, since he's been here in moving Kansas City Public Schools forward. But I also want to commend him on how he handled himself and the press conference yesterday in the aftermath of the tragic shooting of a young 
teenager at Central Academy for Excellence. He called the community out. This is not just a KCPS problem. It's a community problem. It's a law enforcement problem. It's a gun control problem. Got to move along, Crosby. So I want to toast the Kaufman Foundation for bringing the Opportunity Zone concept to Kansas City, a, national, a potential national invest, investment in Kansas City uh, from legislation sponsored by Tim Scott and Cory Booker in the Senate. Yes, I did say something nice about Senator Booker. Uh, and uh, to uh, uh, Wendy Gillis and, and Larry Jacob at the Kaufman Foundation who've been uh, pursuing this uh, excellent endeavor. Arthur. I'd like to toast uh, Chief Justice John Roberts. I think um, uh, he is uh, playing an indispensable role in maintaining the independence and integrity of the federal judiciary uh, against an onslaught of challenges that, um, uh, that, uh, that threaten uh, the independence of our federal judiciary, and he's standing firm. Annie. I'm toasting my friend Bobby Kendricks today. He is the executive director of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, a longtime client. They are due to celebrate their 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues that were founded here in Kansas City. A new logo and a new look. I'm very excited. All and right. finally, here's a toast to the Chinese New Year, which began on February the 5th. This is the year of the pig. The Chinese New Year website says the pig is associated with wealth and is a signal of good fortune. So you'll wonder, how are pigs reacting to this honor? Whee! Whee, whee, whee! <laughs> Thanks to Maxwell, the Geico pig, for appearing on the program. That is Ruckus for this week. We'll be back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckus and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks for watching and good night.